and uh, welcome to the EGX Res Developer Sessions. Nice one. Um, so at the end of the session, there will hopefully be a bit of time for Q&A. What we're going to do uh, is we're going to put a microphone in the centre aisle. Um, if you have a question for Dean, uh, when he's finished, uh, jump up and queue up and we'll get through as many as possible. But um, you know, if you have a burning question for him and you, uh, you don't get a chance to ask it, he's around for like the whole weekend, so I'm sure there'll be other opportunities. Anyway, without further ado, Dean Hall. Thanks. So it's, it's great to be back here at REST. I guess uh, one of the cool things is that it was basically, I guess, three years ago that when I first came to REST, we were still with the mod and just getting ready to talk about what was going to happen with the standalone. So I kind of wanted to do something kind of special for this presentation. And what I thought I'd do is actually show off our roadmap, the, the long coming roadmap, almost as delayed as our release. Uh, I guess one of the big challenges for us has been dealing with the tremendous response from the community uh, in terms of preparing this roadmap. Because we started preparing it last year, and when we sold way more units than we thought, we realized there was a lot more resources and a lot more that could be done. Uh, so I guess to recap, the mod uh, was released. It got over 2 million downloads. The standalone was announced. The standalone was delayed. The standalone was delayed again and again. And then finally, out of nowhere, we released uh, at the end of last year. And since then, we've sold 1.7 million units through Steam. Uh, today, we've, we've really decided that our focus is going to be on survival and immersion. We think that there's a lot of things that Daisy doesn't do well. Uh, but there's two areas that we think Daisy can really do well, and that's the area that we really want to file, uh, focus on. So today I'm going to talk about what our key milestones are and describe some of the new resources we've got. So I'm kind of treating this a bit like an investor presentation. The hilarious thing is, is that you guys are actually the first people to hear it. The team doesn't know a lot of this stuff, and Marek, our CEO, doesn't either. I met him on... Uh, Wednesday this week, and we were trying to talk about the roadmap, and I was like, oh, it's not finished yet, it's not finished yet. And he's like, oh, well, I'll just watch the presentation <laughs> on Friday. So there you go. But I guess that kind of outlines what the project is to us. We really do see the community as uh, kind of being our investors, and that's why we hop on Twitter, on Reddit, uh, on the forums, things like that. And I guess, you know, we feel an obligation to answer the community's com concerns. And there has been a lot of concerns we had a lot of trouble getting our latest version out. There were some really big problems when we released it. There was a, a massive problem we, we hadn't correctly identified when it was pushed to experimental. And it meant that for basically two or three days, the uh, game was basically unplayable for everyone. So we really want to make sure that doesn't happen uh, again, at the same time as making sure that, I don't know, that we, we, we turn DayZ into a great game. because. I don't think it's even a good game yet. We need it to get it to a good game and then make it a great game. So uh, this is the resources. Uh, you know, we've got a, a couple of new things. So our team actually moved into what, what we're calling Bohemia Interactive Riverside, which is kind of our informal name. So we, we have an office in Prague now that's right by the river. And there's 16 people as part of that core team plus the QA teams moved into the building, and they surge up to about 30 people playing the game constantly. I guess one of the big exciting new things for us is that we purchased, Bohemia purchased a whole studio in Slovakia. Uh, they were formerly Cauldron Studios, located in Bratislava. Uh, there's about 25 people on that team, and they're going to be scaling as they bring on their additional resources up to 40 people, and they're dedicated to DayZ. And they've spent basically the last month working through and actually getting ready to deploy on DayZ. And I'm going to outline some of the cool things that they've actually already done. Uh, and we're pretty excited about what they're going to be able to bring. So the, the immediate goals. Uh, this is, I think, uh, Crystal Kerr, our, our um, art lead, he actually uh, put this screenshot out before. It's showing the new crossbow that uh, we've been working on and getting in-game. So uh, that's actually coming as part of what's, what's coming out in our immediate update. So the highlights are we're looking at developing a much more robust process 
for going out into testing and delivery. Because Daisy has this really complicated core architecture environment, it means it's, it can be very hard for us to ensure that a stable update when we release it is actually going to perform okay when 40,000 people are playing it. But we think, uh, thanks to Brian's work, uh, that we've got a much more robust process going forward. The bow and arrow and crossbow has been a real labour of love. So now when you actually fire the bow or the boat, uh, sorry, the, the arrow or the bolt, uh, it actually sticks in its target, moves around with it, you can recover the bolt and the, the arrow. Uh, we think that's going to be really cool and I'm, I'm actually quite excited to see that get in game. I think it's, it's going to become quite interesting when we get into the hunting and things like that as well. Fireplaces, another labour of love. We spent a bit of time doing some graphical work, getting things like emissive textures, heat haze, all the things we needed to actually make fire look, uh, look semi-decent. We're really using the Elder Scrolls a lot for inspiration for those last two things, because I really like going around and like shooting animals and, and then like skinning them and cooking them in, uh, in uh, Skyrim. Network optimizations kind of got us in a bit of little trouble with the last update when it didn't work too well. But that's something we think is quite important. Uh, originally, when people were posting about it on the forums, we thought they were a bit crazy. But actually, there is a lot of desync de and lag problems. I'm sure everyone here, if I asked, would put up their hands who's played DayZ. So that's, it's an ongoing thing that we're looking at fixing, and we're going to be rolling out some of that. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a bit more later on. Uh, People will be happy to know we're removing spawn penalties for joining the same server. We just needed to develop a different bit of technology. Um, I'm sure the massive sigh of relief breathed by everyone out there. The best case is that we get it out in two weeks. The worst case is uh, towards the end of April. Really depends how it goes with the network optimizations. As always, you can play the latest build by playing experimental. So, the network optimizations, guaranteed messaging. So, one of the problems we have at the moment is that Daisy just, uh, your client and the server, they just spam messages to each other and they don't care if the message gets through. That means they just have to constantly send the same information and hope that some of it gets through. And if you have a network connection that's not perfect, or if the server has a little bit of a hiccup, it causes real issues. So that's why we're moving to this guaranteed messaging, which uh, hopefully we'll be turning on for experimental shortly. That's going to lower the bandwidth usage dramatically, which is going to make those hosting servers a lot happier, because it'll lower the cost, particularly in places like Australia. Uh, it, it also might over, uh, lower the overhead a little bit on the CPU, particularly for the server. And most importantly, it'll help with desync and lag. Fireplaces, so you're finally going to be able to cook things in DayZ. We took a lot of inspiration from Project Zomboid. Uh, really cool game, and you can play it multiplayer as well now. So we took a lot of inspiration. We actually talked with them about it as well, about how they did cooking and things like that. So that's going to be coming in. And you can actually place them as a persistent object in the world and upgrade them over time so they become ovens and you can bake some bread. Yay. Uh, so there we go. I might as well finish the presentation there, really. It's like, well, you can bake some bread. Uh, so respawning loot, I was playing over the weekend, and we actually had this whole plan sorted out uh, for the presentation. Then we were playing over the weekend, and we realized we really need to do respawning loot. Like, it means if, if you don't do it, when you join a server, if the server's been sort of cleaned out for loot, it means it's just a really bad experience, and we need to kind of standardize that. So we've decided looking at dividing the world into kind of quadrants, and then when a quad quadrant's empty for a set period of time, it'll reset. And we're also thinking that it needs to reset the doors as well, so you can't tell if someone's looted it. That brought up a good point by, uh, I think it was Peter, one of our designers, suggested that the door state should randomly be reset on start. So you're not going to know if someone's cleaned out the building or not. Uh, this is really a big priority for us for the next update. And I think that once we do that, it gives us quite a good base level with where we're at with the game. Accelerated time. Uh, hilariously enough, we thought we'd actually released it on experimental, but we hadn't. Uh, <laughs> we'd, we'd released it, and then when we reverted some changes that were causing the desync and lag, we accidentally reverted that as well. So we're going to be pushing that out soon. 
what it means is it allows server administrators to configure their server so that they can speed up uh, time of the day by up to 64 times. They can even slow it down a bit, but seriously, I can't imagine anyone slowing it down. Uh, but at, 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 we debated this a lot, whether we should do it, but, and talked a lot with the community, and I think it's really going to help. Not everybody has 24 hours to sit and play on a computer, which is, you know, it's terrible. People should be able to. But um, it's going to mean that you're, you can get kind of a holistic uh, experience of DayZ in one play session. So we, we're still not entirely sure about how the rules will work for hardcore. We're going to talk with the community a bit more, talk with game server providers, and see something that's going to be workable. But essentially, the way we've got it at the moment is anyone running a server is going to be able to change the amount of time, how fast time passes. It's quite cool. When you set it to like 64 times, you can actually see the shadows all like moving around slowly. Throwable items. This has been something that's been in development for like uh, nearly 12 months now. Uh, the implementation of this bullet physics uh, SDK. And we've even got different materials reacting differently. So if you throw something that's made of wood, it will bounce and roll around differently than if you throw something with metal, uh, metal and plastic and all that kind of stuff. It's all calculated on the server, which is a bit of a gamble from our part, but we felt we needed to do that to stop client-side hacks because it would really open a, a really good door for them to make objects levitate around you and do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and uh, so that's, that's coming in very soon. We've been turning it off uh, and actually just having the code running in the background just so that we could ensure there wasn't too many issues when we deploy it. So expect that to come out on Experimental any day now. Player controls. This was another thing that caused us to redo the whole plan in the last week. Uh, we, he we hear everyone when we had a mouse acceleration option in the controls, and we trolled everyone because it doesn't do anything. It's just a little option that you can turn on and off, and it does nothing. Th there were some, is some issues in purely implementing it, because we do want to model dexterity in DayZ. That's if you put a whole bunch of attachments on your weapon, you're going to be a lot slower to move it around. Uh, we've got a really cool developer called Vespa. He was kind of the guy behind some really awesome stuff for Armor 3 in terms of the player controls and how you move around in Armor 3. He's been working with our, uh, our programmer to implement a whole new system for doing player controls. It's going to, you know, we, we want to support dexterity. We want to have the, the similar, I guess when you go to free look, which is where you hold down alt, move it around, suddenly the, game's felt, the game feels awesome, but then when you try and move your dude around, it's like he's, I think, uh, Total Biscuit or someone said, uh, it was like you know, walking around with a washing machine on your backpack or something like that. Um, so we're also looking at, again, using uh, bullet physics for affecting how movement works, things like jumping and that kind of stuff. So it's quite a sweeping change for us to change all that. So the short term, uh, we're looking at more quarter two for the short term here. That's the new pistol, uh, or up there. That's the new pistol that, um, that Chris was working on as well. Very cool. So ragdoll, very close to being done. Uh, and again, something that we've been working on for nearly 12 months. We almost thought it was never going to make it in, and then suddenly it started working. So the little screenshot I, I put there, you can actually see the, um, the skeleton of the character itself and then the, how the, the ragdolls actually oriented on the basis of that and then finally the skinned player. Uh, it, it's using the bullet physics library that we've actually implemented. We're also going to be able to include falling with it so when your character starts falling he doesn't just stay like this, like super soldier, like discipline. Uh, he's actually going to go, oh my god, I'm falling. And the future, it allows us to do things like dragging and blending uh, you know, body injuries in and, and just open the door completely for us. So yeah, we're really looking forward to getting that through. AI pathfinding. This is an area that we've got a whole team of people in Bratislava working on and they've already achieved quite a lot. This dramatically affects animals and zombies. The techniques being used is to voxelize the, ter uh, the terrain uh, an example of, I guess, voxel game like, you know, Minecraft and stuff like that. Doesn't mean that's how it's going to look, but in terms of how the uh, animals and zombies see it. Uh, we have walkable polygons for the interiors, which means that designers and artists can define 
where and where not the animals and the zombies can actually walk so that they don't just ignore all the walls and ignore all the tables and everything. And uh, it also uh, will help us when it comes to stopping the zombies attacking you from walls and stuff like that too. So we have the first iteration is actually nearly complete for this. But it is such a sweeping change that it's going to require a little bit of time. That's why we've put it down for quarter two. You may see sometimes we will turn it on for testing and experimental, but I think it'll be quarter two before it makes it in for uh, the stable version. 64-bit, finally. Welcome to the past. Um, so we've got that compiling now, thanks to the guys at uh, Bratislava. They actually totally shocked me with this, because I thought, I was like thinking, ah, oh, it's going to be June before they kind of get up to speed. And I was talking with Mark, and he's like, oh yeah, they've got, 60, they've got it compiling in 64-bit. And I was like, what? And uh, yeah, so that, what that means is that our server can actually use a lot more memory. Uh, I guess not super important for at the moment, because the server's kind of using less than two gigabytes anyway. But it means that when we put our physics integration in, new AI, we can start doing a lot more with nav meshes. We can really start doing a lot more on the server if the server can actually hold more resources in its memory. But yeah, it's quite a cool milestone for us, really. The animals prototype, we're not going to have the full implementation because the team that's working on the pathfinding and the collision and all that stuff, they will then move on to the behavior of the zombies and animals. It's going to allow, the initial prototype will basically just have animals wandering around. You'll be able to hunt them. We're going to have six completely new types of animals being done by this team. Uh, and it's really going to round off, I guess, our survival side of it. Persistent objects. We were implementing them and raised our programmer. He's kind of a bit of a genius. He uh, suddenly realized, well, hold on. Why are we just choosing some? Why are we just synchronizing tents and backpacks? Why don't we just synchronize everything? So. That's what we're actually experimenting with at the moment. Uh, we can't guarantee that that's what we'll do, but what we're going to do for a start is we're actually going to monitor and pretend we're saving everything to the database for a while, and then see what the load is. And if the load from that is not too bad, then we will actually implement that. Or we might implement that, that nearly everything saves. Maybe just some things that cause too much performance problems won't save. So that's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, it's coming, essentially, we're going to start monitoring and pretending we're saving everything from the next update. And then in quarter two, we'll actually do the loading. Advanced weather effects, snow and fog. The snow won't settle on the ground, but we want to have pretty little snowflakes falling, the temperature dropping, fog. Uh, we want to have that f affecting the ballistics of your weapon. Same with wind. And uh, I guess the big problem for us is how we visualize to your character that the wind is blowing left or right. Because if you're looking through a scope and you're trying to decide you know, how, many, how much you, ne you need to alter the, the you know, aim off to the left or right, you need to know which direction the wind is. So it's an example of a little problem we need to solve with that. World containers. The new uh, refrigerator is on the, on the left there. Um, and we've, we've got this mostly working. It's basically when you go up to the refrigerator, you're going to be able to look inside it and see some items. Helps us a little bit with performance, means we can have a few more objects in the world, that kind of thing. And then we want to move on to ovens and cupboards, so that they actually become something uh, in the real world itself. So in the media, medium term, and we're talking about quarter three for the year here, a little screenshot of uh, another labor of love coming into the game very shortly, which is the AKM. Multi-threading, multi-core, uh, this is something that kind of exists in the engine a little bit, but not in any way that we can really make a lot of use of for DayZ. It's something that we, we do really want to look at. It's probably going to be a lot more focused on the server, though, because once we do a lot of our client-side updates to the way the client actually works, it's, it's not going to be as important, because most of the calculation is done on the server. Uh, it just means it's going to mean that we'll be able to do more of kind of everything, like a lot more. And we'll also be able to provide a lot more flexibility to server providers. So if you've just got a small community who wants to have your own server, maybe even on your own hive, you, you might uh, not need a very powerful computer and you can scale, scale it back. Uh, but then for really large communities who want to have one, 200, maybe more players, they'll be able to dedicate a whole you know, eight cores to, to DayZ and reach that. 
advanced animals. This is where we move into hostile animals like wolves, maybe bears, stuff like that, as well as our neutral animals like rabbits and zombies and that kind of thing. And then on to companion animals. Uh, we talked about dogs as a definite. Horses is very much on the, on the cards, but there's a lot of experimental work we'd have to do to get that in. New zombie behavior, again a collective sigh of relief I'm sure from everyone. We want to make them more responsive. Uh, we want to change particularly the way that stealth works in the game because it's really just not that much of a priority. In fact, because of what we had to do to get uh, the larger numbers of zombies working, we, we kind of had to abandon a bit some of the more stealth ap aspects of playing as a player, so we want to bring those back in. I think we're going to be able to stabilize zombies a lot more in quarter two, and then when we, we get into uh, the future, we'll be able to improve it a lot more. We want to centralize the loot economy, taking a lot of advice and support from the EVE guys with this, so that we can actually control the amount of night vision goggles, uh, control the amount of advanced weapons, all that kind of stuff globally over all servers on that hive. And I think that's really going to dramatically change the way the game works. It's certainly going to make wearing night vision goggles a dangerous proposition. Barricading. We uh, have taken a lot of inspiration from the Dead Linger. I think they have a really, really awesome barricading system. And uh, that's really what we're going to push for. And I think it's going to be really cool be able to put wood on top of windows, be able to barricade doors, uh, all that kind of stuff we, we want to move in. We want to have it uh, persistent to the server that you're located on. And uh, yeah, I think uh, together with the advanced zombie mechanics where the zombies will come up and bang on your door and break down your barricade, I think it'll uh, dramatically change the game. Basic vehicles. We ummed and ahed about pushing this to quarter four or beyond because we really want to do vehicles well. I know everybody wants them, but if we just slapped in the vehicles that we have with armor, we wouldn't be able to do all the stuff we have planned, which is having like really advanced physics using the Bullets SDK and, and uh, basically created a lot like weapons where we have different attachments that you can add like batteries and all that kind of stuff. So for a start, we're going to start with very basic stuff, bicycle, motorcycle, ATV. Maybe we'll look at doing a small car or something like that. And uh, yeah, I think, I think waiting until quarter three before we really start seriously doing it allows us to do it properly. Modding support. So we, we already actually support modding, uh, and we could turn it on. We just lock it down with how the signatures work because we need to get the basic architecture to support it all and how we deal with it with, with different hives and all that kind of thing. So we have this one standardized experience and then we let the community run with it. Because I think if you look at Daisy the mod, they've just been able to take it to tremendously awesome levels with all the different mods. Some of them even started coming out on Armor 3 with fantastic stuff. So we really want to get in and support that and uh, mix it in with Steamworks. Player statistics, we actually already have the full support for Steamworks achievements working on the server, but because the game has so many bugs, we don't want to turn it on until we're sure that the game is stabilized a bit. So it might start coming on between now and then, but by quarter three we want to have proper uh, um, Steam achievements appearing. Uh, they're generated on the server, so you can't fake them at the client end. Basically the server goes, yep, you've been alive for X amount of days, Here's this little STEAM achievement. We, we also want to look at providing interaction f into our database so that instead of us investing a lot of time doing this really amazing website, we've decided to push it out to you guys as the community and say, here is access to all the statistics and uh, make some awesome, awesome websites. Horticulture. So we're going to start putting uh, it in, so at the moment you can gather berries from bushes. We do want to have it that you can grab pumpkins from the existing bushes, apples from apple trees, all that kind of stuff. But going forward, we want to have it much like Project Zomboid again, a really cool idea they've got, is that you can actually plant plants and harvest them in the world. And that, that's something that we've, we've already started working on the prototype, and we may release that prototype. We're just a little bit worried about how it goes with performance. Long term. This is in quarter four and then beyond. 
there's a few other things that we've got that we don't want to say yet because we don't want to disappoint people, but largely speaking, oh, and this screenshot in the background as well, you can actually see just above the words, you can actually see the bolt from the crossbow is actually stuck into the wood. It was a pretty cool little shot. So advanced vehicles, cars, trucks, planes, we, uh, helicopters, boats, really advanced stuff that we want to get into. Uh, upgradable components, so we want to make it a real end game thing to have a helicopter working. And bearing in mind, combined with our centralized loot economy, there might only be parts for that helicopter that you need on one particular server. So that's where you're like, well, we need all these different parts to finish off our helicopter, we're going to have to go steal someone else's from the server that we know about. But yeah, yeah. so I think um, we're just going to edge in because it has a lot of issues for us with things like the network bubble and that kind of stuff because we need to start increasing the amount of information available but also being selective so we don't have too bad desync for those people operating the vehicles. Advanced animals, horses, animal husbandry, things like that. Extended barricading, so pulling what we've done for barricading and then pushing it out into full construction where you can lay some foundations and actually build your own building. And yeah, persistent to that server. Advanced social mechanics, faction identification methods, uh, like being able to make your own armbands, all that kind of stuff. Um, your spawn being tied to controlled locations. We've got lots of ideas around that as well. And uh, increase UI support for trading. So uh, this is, was just kind of a highlight of some of the basic stuff uh, that we've got planned that are really our, our sort of key milestones. There is a bunch of other stuff that we're going to introduce as we go on. It also doesn't include all the bug fixes and things that we plan on fixing that are already wrong with the game. Things like improving the UI, improving, improving the usability of the game, and, and, and those kind of things. So I guess probably the most important point here is, now that I've done all that, is to just uh, Ask, ask a few questions. I can't see people here, but more or less. Yeah. Say again? Oh, right. So I have to ask anyone who wants to ask a question. They tell me, look at that, magically, there's a uh, microphone there. So if you, if you come up to the microphone and you can ask a question. Hello. Um, Dr. Big Money wants to know what's the plans to improve nighttime? Maybe uh, lighting or zombie mechanics? Yeah, um, look, that's a really good point. We, we do have a lot of plans to improve the lighting. Some of it is limited because we're on DirectX 9, but our team has actually already started pulling out the, uh, the renderer. Because at the moment, DirectX 9 is indelibly tied to the simulation. If we can kind of disconnect it out from the simulation, it means we could replace it with DirectX 11 or something like that with much greater ease, make it run on Linux, all that kind of stuff. And I guess that ties in quite nicely with being able to do some visual improvements to nighttime and, and all that kind of stuff. I saw some really good pictures on Reddit of a guy who'd sort of taken a nighttime screenshot and then recolored it and things like that. It, it is hard because Daisy is a seamless game. It goes seamlessly from day to night. Uh, and it also uses real world position of the sun, real world position of the stars. So it's not easy just to, we, we've got to deal with things like HDR that has to be able to deal with a situation where it seamlessly goes from midday to dusk to night and then maybe someone shines a torch at it, all that kind of stuff. And that's the main issue we have to ro resolve with making nighttime look better. As an example, in uh, Armour 2, uh, running DayZ, nighttime, there were no materials shown, so it was all just flat colour, no normal maps, no nothing. And Meaver, our graphics programmer, he managed to get a full super shader materials working. So I have no doubt it will be able to help and make things look a bit better. Okay, fantastic. And um, just a second question, do you have any plans to implement the rivers from VBS? Uh, I think if we're going to... VBS is, is really oriented to, I guess, that Melsim side of it. So. In terms of inspiration for rivers, I'm much more interested in what Skyrim did. We've, we've already done a little bit of prototyping with how we can do that. Uh, it's not on the roadmap at the moment because I guess we don't see it as a key aspect, 
but it is something that, uh, for example, if we if we're able to hire more resources onto our team and actually grow to that point, uh, we'd be able to add new stuff to our roadmap that we don't have here. It's it's not a question of money with that though. It's really being able to find the right people to bring them on on the team. So if we're able to to find a group of a whole group of new people that we can attach to the team, we could get a bit more ambitious with some of the lower priority world stuff. Hi, yeah, I know you said that you'd be introducing time um, to, towards the admins of the server, and obviously what I'd ask is, what about food and hunger times? So I know you've, it's not balanced perfectly yet, but we, we, would you be able to give the control of balance towards admins to balance their own decisions and how fast they get hungry or thirsty? Absolutely. I think server admins are getting a bit of a raw deal at the moment and kind of our like gesture of offering is accelerated time. Thank you for paying all that money to host a server. Here have some accelerated time. So yeah, this is an example. We just want to slowly start moving stuff towards the server admins. Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, I've got um, two questions. First one is um, when are you expecting to get the full release out? Say again, sorry? Uh, when do you expect to get the full release out? Like, as it oh, full release. Out? I think probably we'll finish, our, we'll have a, a sort of a lock at our end by the end of this year, and then we'll test it for a few months. It's not a good idea to release it right at the end of the year, so I would expect that would come in quarter one next year. Right, and um, what's your favorite Pokemon? Uh, Pikachu, definitely Pikachu. He's so Much cute. better. Fair enough. Much cops way better. Oh, God. Uh, I was just thinking, um, do you think you've sacrificed some part of the fun in the game for realism? Yes, absolutely. Uh, a good example would be the fact that you can't move the player very well at the moment. And instead of us just implementing a very counter-strike style, your character instantly turns when you move the mouse, that does sort of sacrifice some of the fun of it a bit. And I think that's the precarious balance that we follow. Uh, you sort of have realism on one end and then and then to an extent you can kind of have fun on the other end. We try and be sort of in the middle ground of, uh, of authenticity. Because I certainly think if we made this as a real scenario, it would not be fun. I don't think, well there's probably some people who would think that the apocalypse situation would be fun, but I think modeling that completely not so much. So yeah, I th and that's kind of the, the balance, the, the line we need to walk. Cheers. Um, that was Recently, a Q&A on Reddit with Senshi about underground areas. I was just wondering if you could cover anything on that. Yeah, so you'll notice it's not on the road map. <laughs> um, I guess the importance is, and what really the last month has kind of taught us, is how much we make sure the core pillars of the game actually work. And that's why you see that not there. It's not something we'd write out for, for doing in future, but I think for this year we need to have achievable goals so that we actually meet those goals. You see I've put quarters to them. I hope that as we go we're able to actually line them up to dates and say on this date we're going to hit this. But reaching that point is going to be a process. So there's just, I guess, no more information on, on large-scale underground structures at this point. Uh, there was quickly a question from my mate. It was about, um, about the barricading. What, will there be anything to stop people from server hopping into your, like, your building that you've barricaded up? Yeah, that's one of the reasons we've kind of pushed it a little bit further, is we need to start up with the concept of controlled areas that you can't spawn in. The final advance kind of that will appear in quarter four, but we need to start crossing the issue when it comes to barricading. I, don't, I think we'll probably get barricading working before we get controlled areas working, but at least by the time uh, we get barricading working, we'll have an idea of how we solve that. All right, cheers. Hello, Dean. Hello, we met before. Edgar, right? Edgar from the Cell Pierlami podcast. Uh, Fair enough. I would like to know, at what point will I be able to put my face on the guy? Uh, your face on the character? Sure. Yeah, we, you, you were able to do that uh, in Armour 2, but uh, commonly people use, usually use it for doing pretty hilarious things. We, so again, we, so, there's a phrase uh, in the industry, I'm not going to use it here, but it's basically where people go and do immature things very quickly with the game. You're talking about a wiener, right? I am talking about that, and it happened very quickly in Spore. But um, 
So uh, um, basically, it comes back to that survival and immersion, which is really our, what we think are the pillars of the game. So we want to allow the players to customize a lot more. I think we have plans for like 20 new character heads. We might be looking at providing some level of customization, uh, being able to freely choose hair and that kind of stuff, and even beards and things like that. But I think we need to provide, it's kind of like that other person was saying, that balance between giving sort of full control, and, you know, which is sort of fun, and then realism where we try and link it together. Sure, thank you. Thanks. Cool, thank you very much, Dean. Thanks, everyone.